You're listening to Dark City Radio Live. Tune in at www.darkcityradio.com. You can find us by searching Dark City Radio on Facebook or Twitter. Good evening. Welcome to the Permaculture Show. Here we are again. I've been out um, up the allotment today. It's been favourable conditions and speaking to a few people. Um, I think in this country and other parts of the world, we're all set for a bit of gardening. So I thought I'd run through a few things that you can plant up at the minute, which is quite a lot really because it's the season for doing it. So um, I've been putting on some French beans, some runner beans, um, haven't yet, but you can get on some cucumbers now, some tomatoes, the ones that you're going to transplant outdoors. Um, courgettes are good to put on now, marrows, um, what else? Peppers, peppers are a good one because you can just have them anywhere. They're great on a windowsill. Herbs, nories. Herbs, they're really easy to do now. In fact, we've... Uh, yeah, someone bought me some herbs today that they'd actually, supermarket ones are great if you do frequent a supermarket because they just mass sow them. So when you buy them, there's literally, you know, 20 to 30 plants in one pot. Um, and a lady today bought me some basil she'd been propagating. I wanted to talk about that because when I was in my early days of gardening and stuff, you get a bit freaked out by propagation, like it's some magical thing <laughs> that only really experienced gardeners can do. But it's mostly... Oh, that's just... true. Don't give it away. Mm. Mm. You have to be really experienced. Mm. Well, you have to I... know how to take a cutting and push it into the soil. That's yeah. it. Exactly, exactly. And some things root so easily. I mean, I love scented geraniums. Oh, they're so nice. Yeah, and um, they just propagate so easily. Just chop bits off them, stick them in the soil, and they'll grow. What I actually did, I don't know if it will work, but this was another thing that really has only just occurred to me as a concept. <laughs> that, you know, any prunings you do, really, you can propagate. I had to Absolutely. cut a load of, yeah, I had to cut a load of lavender back because of the snow. It had all battered it down. And the, I haven't had time to pot them up or anything. I've just stuck them in the garden. There were loads of them, loads of little bits of growth. So they're all in the garden at the minute. I kind of figured I can put a cloche over them, a plastic bottle or something if conditions deteriorate. So, yeah. There's, you know. well, there's lots of gardeners, Nairis, that um, take cuttings in the autumn um, put them under cold frames or whatever for the winter just in case mm. because you never know what the weather's going to bring so it's kind of worth doing it anyway and if you don't need them you can yep. give them to your neighbours can't you exactly exactly yeah well I was talking to a guy yesterday and he did that with his um, black currant um, bushes when he cut them back in the autumn he just stuck all the prunings into the soil and they've all, well, he was saying they're budding, but they're not quite rooting yet. But apparently that, that will come. That's just normal. So I think it takes time to develop the root system. But, um, yeah, it just shows, you know, you can just literally grow, grow from anything, can't you? Leftover potatoes are the other one, aren't they? Everyone gets them where they just start shooting um, in the kitchen, you know. Never, yeah, or in um, the fridge, you know. I mean, if the eyes develop... Mm. At that point, it might be worth putting them in the soil. Mm, exactly. That's why I, I had that with them um, chickpeas as well. That's how I started growing chickpeas. I mean, fortunately, nature, the way it works is to carry on and you know, be the healthiest it can. So it kind of doesn't matter if it in a fridge it will still try and grow because that's its mission in life yeah yeah exactly. so it's always on our side isn't it mm, mm, definitely definitely that's why <clears throat> you know from the observation and the kind of that's we've bit that's what i've been doing today really up at um, the allotment we were planting the trees and the shrubs for the little forest garden creating that system up there you know oh, it'll be good to hear about that 
Yeah, well, it was a little bit later than we'd have liked, really, for trees and shrubs to go in, but, um, you know, can't be helped. But, um, yeah, it was, um, I think I mentioned before, from Felipe, who came on a couple of weeks ago from what he does. He, um, we'd got some trees for, from them for free. Um, a Siberian pea tree, which I'm really excited to see because um, they're really hardy and they get little pods which are edible and you can <coughs> kind of eat them like that or you can um, dry the pods and um, then use the seeds like a, a lentil sort of thing or grind them for flour in fact so if uh, if that does well that will be a real you know i'm quite interested in finding alternatives for all that sort you know like flour and your kind of staple staple foods i think that's kind of really quite important <laughs> isn't it <laughs> well it's very important isn't it mm-hmm. because if suddenly there was no shops anymore you got to be able to deal with it out of what you can grow so exactly. now's a really good time to be experimenting and practicing isn't it? Mm, well it is because there's the sorts of things that people don't think of as luxuries aren't they but they are aren't they like sugar and bananas and they're like luxury items really <laughs> absolutely yeah mm, mm. so yeah anyway we put that in we put a crab apple in we steered away from sort of apples and pears because there's already quite a lot of that sort of stuff and plums. There's a lot of that already on site. So, um, yeah, because uh, crab apples are quite high in pectin, I believe. So they're quite good for um, jam making. They yeah. are, but the other good thing is that the, they will cross-pollinate with any apples that you already have. Ah. Um, the bees will make sure of that. Fantastic. And we also put... I hesitate to mention this because we put an elegance in and just before we, we were coming on air, I suddenly realised I can't remember what an elegance is for, what kind of crop it has or anything. So I don't know if anyone else knows <laughs> because it's just, it wasn't the tree I wanted intentionally. So I haven't researched it as much as <laughs> the others. <laughs> I wanted a maybe, maybe somebody in the chat room can Google it and let us know. Yeah, yeah. I tried to find out frantically beforehand, but then I thought, no, it's not happening. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so we also, for the kind of shrub layer, we put a few shrubs in today. We've got two different types of gooseberries, one's for cooking and one you can just pick straight off the tree. And eat well, oh. bush rather shrub. <laughs> I didn't know you could get gooseberries that were sweet enough to eat straight away. No, well, t- I didn't, to be honest, Bob. But um, yeah, that's what they were offering. I mean, I've always had grown um, cooking ones. That's certainly what I've got up my allotment. The one that it's obviously some kind of hybrid. The one that uh, you can eat off the bush hasn't got any thorns on. So ah, mm, okay. Mm, um. And actually, well, I don't know if it is interesting to anyone else, but the um, Siberian tree, pea tree is, um, has got little spines as well, which I wasn't expecting, but there you go. <laughs> um, and, yeah, we've got some um, two um, edible honeysuckles, which oh, is, really? um, yeah, and they're um, shrubs, apparently. So, oh, they're yeah. not climbers? No, they're not climbers, yeah, they grow as a shrub. Um, so, yeah. Um, the flowers are edible on those. I think the berries as well. I think you can use the berries off there. Sounds like so. a good thing for a, a wine or a distillation, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, hopefully they're all looking. That's that's what we've put in today. There was already some dog roses there and a fairly young birch. So, uh, yeah, they're all looking really healthy. I've got them healed in at my allotment because they all came bare-rooted and then um, they've all budded up and um, blackened or anything from the weather. I think the snow was actually keeping the soil quite warm, you know, so it did have a benefit in that way. So, um, yes, it's just uh, to see see the diversity come to life there. Oh, I linked that in really well. <laughs> <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> Um, so presumably the jet stream has gone over the top of you now as well, is it? Yeah, it was. Re- oh, it was lovely today. It was like a proper April day, 
um, it was a little bit moist this morning and then we had a bit of rain and then the temperature rose slightly. So it was kind of, I know I've spoke to older people who said around this time of year, you know, in their young days, it literally would be sort of steam rising from the streets where it was wet and it yeah. got, you know, it must have been amazing. <laughs> um, but it was a little bit like that today. So it was, uh, yeah, perfect, perfect April day. <laughs> And the, the moon's waxing now as well. We just had a new moon. Yes. So now's a really good time to get plants in. That's interesting you say that. I hope we can focus more fully on that on a future programme. Oh, biodynamics. I mean, it's just following the moon phase, isn't it, really? And and intentioning oh, the plants I as mean, well. Um, Putting intention in. us today. Should yeah, she bought me a moon, um, you know, a book all about the uh, the phases of the moon and the right times for planting and biodynamics. Um, it's something I, I haven't really got into myself, so, um, which is funny really, because, yeah, I could, uh, gardening at night and stuff is probably better for me, being ginger. <laughs> I do tend to get sunburnt a lot by overexcited getting out in the garden and doing it when the sun comes out, so... <laughs> Yes, so I'll definitely, um, she's given me a few links, so I'll try and get uh, someone on who, uh, oh, I'm not reading the chat. Is anyone reading the chat? Um, I'm not, I don't uh, have that enabled on this. I, oh, haven't you? I mean, I can if you want, I can go and no, sort that. It's all right, I'll stop and have a look now. Is it okay to plant hybrid gooseberries in an organic garden? Well, I suppose it depends how they've been hybridised, really. Um, obviously there are kind of more you know when your original plantsman kind of started this kind of thing back in the day it was a little bit more of a, a symbiotic relationship I suppose with the plant but obviously there are other methods used these days I don't know what do you think Bob? Well my opinion was because it's a hybrid just means that it's um being grown in favour of special attributes, it's mm. not genetically modified, which is a whole different ball game altogether. And in if, if you grow a hybrid plant in an organic environment, I don't see that there's any issue with that. No, no. Well, I think I'd, I'd be, be, yeah. I mean, it's I not a heritage really. plant, um, so you need to think about that a bit. But if you grow it organically, it's no different, <coughs> is it? No, no, definitely not, no. I think there's sort of the GMO thing and the whole problems with the food chain there is more focused on seeds, really, at the minute than plants. So well, um, there's lots of stuff coming into the, the food chain and the, the plantsman chain that are genetically modified as well. Oh. I mean, they're doing it to trees. Oh, God, don't. There's GM don't. trees now. So. Oh. Oh, oh, I haven't. Monsanto oh, I just want to take over. Yeah, <coughs> I haven't seen any. Oh, put, send some links about that, Bob. I haven't seen anything about that to do with trees. Oh. Okay, yeah. I'll see if I can dig some out so. so it can go on the bottom of the podcast. Yeah, yeah cool, cool. Okay. Um... <clears throat> but yeah, so really, di diversity was the thing I was going to sort of mostly chat about tonight, you know, and kind <coughs> of the importance of it really, and why it's important, and how diversity sort of exists in in the world, as it were. Um, so I suppose as a starting point, um, you've got species diversity, obviously. Um, so the number of different species of plants, animals, um, which are grown or kept in a cultivated ecosystem. Um, you've then got genetic diversity, which is different varieties. Um, so, so basically you've got, got a species, which is a group of plants or animals that can interbreed amongst themselves and produce fertile offspring. Um, and then you've got a variety, which is kind of a group 
which is individuals of the same species which show common characteristics. Um, right, that's always a bit confusing. I hope I've explained that okay. <laughs> um, so then you've got sort of ecological diversity, which is the sort of ecosystems on a wild scale, on the kind of the bigger picture, wild plants and animals. And then you've got cultural diversity, um, which is sort of human human stuff, activity, food growing and whatever else. Uh, human diversity sounds like an interesting area. Well, it is exactly. It's funny, actually, because when I was sort of pondering on human diversity, it's, it's similar to in permaculture. I know Felipe was talking about this, about edges and you know, how edges are the most productive places because it's where things meet or people meet and ideas get... Now uh, you've cut out on me, Nairi, so I don't know whether I'm still in the loop or not. But I'm kind of lucky living down by the coast because we've got two edges that meet there, which is the ocean and the land. And there's this little strip there is neither one or the other. Oh, that put eight on me again, that did. Sorry, I didn't catch what you said there. No, I was just... I, 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 you dropped out as well, so I don't know oh. how viable this conversation is, but I was just saying <laughs> that I live... Where I live, it's between... It's in an area where the ocean meets the land, mm, mm. and there's this little strip along it, which is just so abundant where it's you know both life forces meet that's where the magic happens <laughs> it is it <clears throat> absolutely is yeah it's where everything grows from mm. um well I know, I know that there are um different ecologists kind of take on different views about this there's kind of the one view that um you know obviously diversity um, and stability are kind of, you know, there's a massive po positive correlation between the two. Um, whereas I suppose the other view is more that, you know, species redundancy is kind of vital to a functioning ecosystem and that, you know, the, a, any, a, a thing can exist with a limited number. I think it's more of a clinical kind of scientific view, really, that, well, everything could still happen with only this number of things going on, you know. <laughs> it's, there's no kind of life force there, but that's really a personal opinion. I don't know. <laughs> um, in my experience, um, clinical science mm. has no place in nature. No. It only explains stuff for a very small amount of time in a very small window. And when you get sucked into that way of thinking, you don't allow for the holistic side of nature where anything is possible. Yeah. No, I'd agree with that, definitely. I always think, of, you know, science can sort of take the magic out of stuff, can't it? It's like the nuts and bolts of something, you know, just explains the mechanics of something. I think it takes all the magic out of things. Why can't you just look at something and go, ah, oh, yeah, that's really amazing. And when that happens, that happens. And that's, that's fine. <laughs> I don't need to know anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm kind of of the opinion that science has spin put on it anyway, and I don't trust a lot of it anymore. No, no. Well, I mean, you, so much has been discredited recently. Well, you, you, I mean, you can see the split, can't you? If you go back in history, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, at one point, you know, the, the church discouraged science. So I found some because I did a bit of reading up on um, Cole Pepper, you know, the herbalist. Yes. Um, and obviously, I'd sort of been into herbs, read sort of. Book to you know what he had to say about herbs and things but um he was actually a really interesting guy and oh this is a bit off on a tangent really it's, but well it's diverse so it's not <laughs> um <laughs> and he was kind of the split in the medical profession there where he wanted 
You disappeared again, Nairi, so I don't know if it's me or you. A beast for the people, and at that time was becoming, you know, the kind of established physicians who wanted to kind of had hold the, these positions of power and provide this service for the people. Well, the thing with modern medicine is it only wants to deal with things that it can make money out of. Mm. And herbs, you can't. You can't control them, can you? You can't say, hey, look, that bit of sage is mine. Mm. That's it. All the sage on the planet is mine, or all the rosemary, or all the thyme. Mm. And exactly. So it's discouraged, you know. Let's mm. not use any of that. It's old thinking. We've got brand new drugs that are patented and cost a lot of money and we design them to make you not very well. So you have to have more drugs. Mm. Which exactly. you have to pay for. I know. That's why I, I mean think this I'm this is what I don't get about herbalism and the like being called alternative medicine. It's not. It's original. Modern mes- medicine really is the alternative. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, original medicine. Let's all yeah. call it that now. Yeah, no, I'm a lot, I do. I like that, yeah. Well, I'm thinking of, because obviously there's all these um, laws now, isn't that, with Agenda 21 and everything, and, come, and um, oh, that one I can't pronounce. Oh, it's don't Latin, get me started Lumen. on Agenda 21. <laughs> well, what I think I'm going to try and do with the permaculture group is, right, because so many people are ill nowadays. It really upsets me. So many people I know are ill in one way or another. And, you know, you chat to them and they're like, oh, my back's doing this or whatever. So I've kind of been thinking about doing these her herbal workshops but they're not workshops so no one's paying for anything and nothing's being made for anyone else and if we can research the kind of things you know preparations people might need they can come and make them themselves and I'm sure if it's done in that way it can be worked around the laws because people are making it themselves oh I haven't quite got that theory straight in my head yet but I think you can get get the idea (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, it's only legislation, it's not law. Well, true, true, but it depends because, you know, I'm kind of um, the sorts of people that come into the groups and the meetings and everything are all different kinds of people, so from all different backgrounds, so... um, Absolutely, but if you feel it's right, it's right, isn't it? mm, As mm. long as it doesn't cause harm, damage or loss... Well, exactly. If an adult comes in to a room and they're happy to do something, then that's fine, isn't it? <laughs> Sounds a bit dodgy. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> right, so I'll bring it back to diversity now then, because um, what I really wanted to talk about was um, plants and how plants form these systems um in particular, I'm just looking now with them. Um, the red. Did you see that picture? I'll put a picture on Facebook for you, Bob, of my ramsons coming through. I did. Yeah, cool. They yeah. Look beautiful. Oh, I know. See, it's a little patch, but it's getting there. I've been tending it. <laughs> so, um, you know, they're a good example because they come up in the forest before the trees come into leaf. So they've kind of got this system going there where they do their thing and then the trees come in after that um, and in a similar way you've got plants with diff- different root systems so some things like dandelions um, have really deep roots so they'll go right down and help to sort of aerate the soil um, and bring up nutrients from lower down um, and then obviously you've got things with um, shallow roots which all spread across and you know in some ways there's um an element of combating erosion if you have that kind of issue um and then obviously things like clover fix the nitrogen in the soil so kind of each little component will have a certain niche and fill that and so it creates 
a cycle. <laughs> They're all cycles. I was having trouble putting this subject in order, actually, because they all form circles, and I didn't know where to start from. It doesn't form an actual logical pattern. See. Well, mostly they're spirals, I think, rather than circles. Yeah. I mean, a circle is a closed thing. Mm. Mm. But a spiral's open and it goes from um, one stage to the next, to the next, to the next. But because it's in a spiral, when you get back to the first stage, you've moved forwards. Mm. So it's change, but not back to the same. Yeah. Every, every bit of change is into a different space. Mm. Yeah. Oh, I'll have to ponder on that. <laughs> yeah. That's good. I've really had the urge to draw, actually. I, could, I need to draw some kind of thing that's all into it. Anyway, yeah, I'll do well, that. <laughs> if, you, if you imagine the Tai Chi 2 symbol, you know, yin-yang. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. That explains how... At the maximum of yin, you've got the growth of yang. Mm. But in a two-dimensional sense, it's flat, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah. if you now picture that rotating and moving forwards at the same time, mm. when you've got the maximum of yin and the growth of yang's happening, it's happening further along in time so it's not the same as it was when it happened the previous time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it won't be the same as it will happen the next time mm-hmm. and, and that's what change is it's the difference yeah yeah oh <laughs> I can't ponder on that now I'll have to ponder on that later that's going to take a couple of hours worth of digestion that is Bob um so yeah and just a a little mention about weeds obviously well so-called weeds i don't really like that term myself you know as we i know i've talked about that before as they are part of the system and you know they're, they're pretty much all got uses and they should be integrated they are well they are integrated into the system it's just that we don't we haven't observed it or realized so, um, and then, yeah, so I was going to talk, um, oh, a little bit about wildlife as well, because obviously, you know, that's kind of part of the natural order as well. And if you've got a diverse plant system, you've got a diverse insect and, um, I don't know, whatever else, small mammals, frogs, bird population, um, which again brings a kind of, you know, generally a kind of balance to, natural predators and um beneficial insects there um in fact we built we've just this week built um a bug house up at my own a lot my own personal allotment me and the kids it was inspired by bridget and, Yay. Uh, yeah and i was um, <laughs> thinking you know it's a great time of year to do it and we'd got pallets up there so we've literally just scavenged what was around we built this for absolutely nothing we make we used four pallets which were from um a, a local company that we just got for free um and then the rest was either from around my garden here we got some canes which i'd got from a lady who grows it not many people grow cane anymore do they i know no. my nan always no, but- used to grow it well, I was going to say, I hope you got some pictures of this bug house. Um, I did put one in the um, the Facebook, our permaculture Facebook group. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have a look in there. Yeah, it's looking, it's looking pretty good. It needs a bit more filling, but we've got some really nice... In fact, God, I'm such a hoarder. I've got these bamboo. I used to work in a clothes shop years ago. And they were from the window. I used to do the window displays. They're these really cool bamboo, like big thick proper bamboo um the cutting half big bamboo. yeah big bamboo i can't be more specific than that it's just big bob Sorry, no, <laughs> massive i had to do that <laughs> yeah it's a technical technical term massive bamboo <laughs> then if you <laughs> um and yeah i use some prunings because i just pruned down um some stuff out of my garden we put that in um 
and some stones and then we went scavenging round and because that's the one benefit our allotment site is so run down it's still council run at the minute they just don't do anything with it well yeah, they're mowed the council past. don't do very little that has any benefit to anybody apart yeah. from they, they mowed the path. yeah they, they mowed the path and um, cut the trees down a few just before the sort of um snow was it and um we had a meeting, and they're like, they're just like kids, they're like that, like really tough to them. Like, well, we've we've mowed the path, <laughs> cut the trees down, and they didn't even leave the logs on site for us to be able to use. I reckon they sold them on or something. Yeah. It's outrageous. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's good for scavenging round. We found a load of old bricks, so I'm hoping to tempt a few frogs and toads. Um, and I'm still eyeing up that bath that next door's got out on their drive. Oh, yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. go and knock on the door, man. Yeah, I will. I'll. Uh... Have you gone again? Am I still here? I yes, you're... I can you hear you. Contact me then. Go it on. might just be um, you yeah, and so me, and sure. the rest of the world has gone. <laughs> it could could be could be. <laughs> we'll carry on anyway. <laughs> um, we could we can make plans for our sea urchin farm then, Bob, if everyone else has gone. <laughs> I had to think about this, and actually the, the urchins are the one that use whatever it is that has the THC, so uh, uh, we'll in- save that for later, I think. Yeah, more investigation. Reco- okay, yeah, shh, keep that secret then. Don't talk about that. Don't talk about the sea urchins. <laughs> You'll have to come back next week. <laughs> um, yeah, so with the bath, I'm thinking, well, if we get hold of it, which I'm sure will be fine because they'll want to get rid of it, um, whether to fill it, we just fill it with water, or maybe do some kind of bog garden. I'm not sure. Oh, I've um, got plenty of bricks and things. You could do that. Mm, well, like I said, it's just loads of rubble. In fact, you have to have a look at the bug house because we found this amazing stone. It's like a little um, tombstone. <coughs> it's not huge, but yeah, it's crying out for something to be painted on. To paint on it? Plant on top of it. I don't know if it's me or you cutting in and out, Maurice. Oh, it's me. It's me. I'm cutting in and out. Oh, it's you. Yeah. Oh, I don't know why. My brother still hasn't come and checked my computer out for me. You put 10p in the meter. (laughs) Don't spit in it. (laughs) I don't know. I've got a bit of dry mouth, actually. So, yeah, so we've do, done the bug house, so and it costs nothing, so it's another another boost for the diversity on the allotment. And, in fact, some one of the things I've done in my garden as well is, because um, I, watched, I watched the birds a couple of years back just decimate the lettuce I'd got out there, and they were loving it. <laughs> yeah, um, of course. So I tend to plant things for the birds now. And, in fact, well, isn't... slugs as well. Isn't that what permaculture is? It's yeah. creating an environment where you give up something that's of benefit to something else because at the end of the day it, it all lives together and creates abundance. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you just kind of, you know, at, uh, oh, can't even put it into words. <laughs> um and yeah, this I I found I don't know if I've never found anyone else that that has come across these, but the slugs here <laughs> I find love French marigolds. They're not a thing I'd tend to plant normally, but I don't know if it's because they're strongly scented or what. But I find they go for those before anything else, so I tend to plant those around for the slugs. It's probably a slug drug. Could be, could be. I mean, we've I've got loads of um, leopard slugs here as well. Oh, really? Um, yeah. They got you know, legs the as well. <laughs> yeah, and they growl. No, <laughs> <laughs> they've just got a mottled back. But they are quite <laughs> interesting because I think I mean they do eat green stuff, but they also eat brown stuff. Um, and they also you you they, you get them a lot in the compost heap. Um, they also do eat other slugs. Um, oh, they all do that. Do they all do that? Do they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's all. Uh, yeah, that. if you if you stand on a slug, all his mates will come around and do that. No. <laughs> well, there's no waste. 
<laughs> well, true, true, yeah. Uh, no, I never knew that. Oh, I don't know as much about slugs as I thought I did. <laughs> no, slugs are amazing. Yeah, they are. They'll yeah. come and live in your living room. Oh, we get them in here all the time, yeah. And what are they eating? Um... Well, well, it's. I mean, I've got a conservatory, you see, which is kind of half conservatory, half greenhouse. So, but actually, what they're eating is skin scales and things like that off the floor. That makes sense. God, they're really weird, aren't they? They're weirder than I thought. That's another thing. I should make a list when I talk to you of things that I need to think about afterwards. <laughs> The other weird thing about slugs is their mouth is on the side of their body. Oh, well, I no, just they... had a comment, so is their arsehole, but hopefully it's the <laughs> other side. <laughs> <laughs> I know that um, leopard slugs have that really weird mating ritual as well, you know, where they get and they extend that kind of really long, luminous blue. I don't know what it they, I don't know what it is. They both climb up a tree and then they extend that down and then they both all like slither right. Ooh, slither right. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's really amazing. It sounds really oh. gross, but it's actually really amazing. How close are you to a nuclear power station? <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. And slugs can <laughs> climb really high. It's... Right, diversity. Avoid leopard slugs. Facts are really vague. I'll find some links on that because I've seen pictures online of it as well. It's really amazing. <laughs> the diversity of sea slugs alone are like diverse in in multitudes, aren't they? <laughs> and they're things people hate. But the the worst thing ever is to put slug pellets down. Yeah. Oh no, I never do. I never do. No, no, it's not an accusation. It's a statement. It's, <laughs> no, do well, it. I, I no, I, I, I hate them. I mean, hedgehogs I do, will I, eat all your slugs. Just uh, encourage them. Yeah, yeah, we've got some hedgehogs. Yeah, and slow yeah, worms. Yeah, which just shows you. I mean, I've got, you know, it's it's a fair, fairly all right size garden for a kind of urban Birmingham type garden. You know, it's all right, and but. I mean, you know, it's in the city, and the, the diversity that I get here is just phenomenal. I mean, we do get sparrow hawks as well, because there's kind of a little old um, brook um, about a mile and a half away. It's intermingled through the houses. I mean, there's road on every side now. It's just literally the brook itself and trees either side, but it's there, and it's supporting, again, it's another, oh, everything's connected to diversity. That, that alone is supporting um, a, a, a mass um, ecosystem and that's why I was saying I don't know if I explained it well last week about observation of the wider area because then about three miles that way there's this massive ancient wood which way? Uh, 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 oh god uh, I can't tell from here no you can't tell it probably doesn't matter I'm trying to work it out east west it's Towards where the sun south, comes up. South, south, south. south. Well, well, I suppose we could move on really to, um, you know, sort of a couple of permaculture methods of diverse ways of gardening, really, you know, to kind of, it's for, you know, diversity in each sort of section. Uh, encourages diversity. Oh, it's what you were saying about the spiral bar, but that's it. That's what, it, that's what I'm trying to say. So um, it is. I mean, really, I mean, there's lots of people lay down rules about permaculture, but the way I like to look at it is it's organic. Mm, mm. You know, just just feel it, really, yeah. rather than try to learn it, mm. because nature talks to you. Exactly. And well, it I wants want... you to look after it. I, w- I wanted to mention stacking and kind of, you know, different layers of, of growing, you know, using vertical space as much as um, the horizontal. Uh, um, and really, you can, you know, you can grow 
on any surface, any surface you want to grow on, you'll find something that will grow on there. Um, Apart from I mean, copper. Copper, you can't grow on yeah. no, I don't suppose, yeah. Copper kills everything. Yeah. Okay. No but copper. It's designed <laughs> to do that. It's, you know, mm -hmm. a useful yeah. material. Um, but yeah, I was just, obviously, there's the kind of um, thing with um, trees and grow it, you know, that's a really good one, I think, for urban situations, looking at growing um, fruit trees um, against walls um, and training them that way. Um, Don't forget your nuts. Nuts, of course, yes. Nuts are really important. They've got more protein than fruit. Mm. Mm. And they're, they're a good staple diet, you know, walnuts, pecans, hazels, mm. and obviously sweet got chestnuts. You could, um, the one you can't food. grow, of course, is um, Brazil's. But yeah, nuts are really, really important. For your staple diet as well. Uh, yeah, monkey puzzle tree, that's another one. Yeah. Yeah. I know when I went to the co ed hills, they were selling some of those. I know they're. Uh, I did uh, pinch some from a tree around the corner <laughs> in the autumn. Why, why are monkey see. puzzle trees good? Um, well, Prajna's just saying in the chat it, they're the most um, nutritious food you can grow. Um, but they are supposed to be really delicious. I think it's some correct me if I'm. Um, well, I think they're very similar to a pine nut. They, I think that's you know, um, so you can just sort of lightly toast them or sprinkle them over stuff, you yeah. know, because you get that big, massive, spiky pod, and then there's loads of it. They're all tiny, all inside of there. So, but you say you need at least five partners, just saying, to guarantee you have both sexes. Yeah, you, they're uh, male and females. Oh, are they uh, air Otherwise, no nuts. <laughs> are they air pollinated? Uh, I'm not sure, to be honest. Well, like oh. um, apples, for instance. If yeah. you just oh, plant an apple tree mm. and there's no other apple tree around, it will never fruit. Yeah. Yeah. You need two. Mm. And it's not that they're male or female, they're both. But they need the other one that's yeah. both to they make need it. The diversity. <laughs> well, it's you know, it's keeping the gene pool in evolution. Yeah. yeah. And that's the key, isn't it? It's evolution. Exactly. Well that's another thing that I wanted to mention as well with diversity was succession. Oh, sorry. Am I there? No, no, it's me apologising for... Oh, <laughs> um, yeah, I wanted to mention <coughs> succession. Um, so, um, you know, I suppose the best example I can think of is kind of a nat how a natural woodland would develop or if you're trying to create a forest garden that you'd kind of have... Um, well, with a natural wood, you kind of have pioneer plants that come in first and kind of prepare the ground to become the right kind of conditions to then start young trees growing. Um, and then obviously if it's a system you're putting in place yourself, you can be a little bit more managed with it. So you have your young, your young plants and then in the first year, say, you can put some annuals in there. Um, and then in the second year, um, you can look to put in your perennial veg in there. And then as it matures on, you can kind of look to planting up some soft fruit there once the trees are a little bit bigger and then look to put in some woodland herbs um, in after that. So there's a kind of a, a stages of various diversity that then, you know, sort of in the end creates a whole integrated system, you know. God, it's amazing, isn't it, really? Yes. <laughs> oh, I just became all overwhelmed by the whole thing then. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, obviously with, with that kind of system, well, in any system, in fact, I, I, I'll 
if people are in the permaculture, I'll post it in the Dark City group as well. I found this lovely um, YouTube film of um, a lady in Ireland, and she just literally got some beds, very small beds, um, and she'd got a whole mass of diverse stuff planted in there, you know, and it was all so healthy and just all so working together permanently, perfectly, rather. Um, it was, yeah, it's about, yeah, I'll, I'll post that link up if I remember. <laughs> Oh, you will. <laughs> I'll remind I you. I think I will, yeah. yeah. I'm um, gonna start... the, the other thing that's worth bearing in mind is what grows naturally as well. I mean, you, you kind of need to live in a space for at least a whole complete set of seasons mm. before you can decide what you want to do with it. Definitely. Definitely. Um, you're, you're only the guardian. You're only somebody who's managing a space the space has its own energy and it will um give everything that needs to be there the space to grow mm. Mm. well and that's it's what better was... to observe that mm. for at least a complete set of seasons before you try to do anything definitely well, that's what I think we, uh, or I can't remember if we were on air or off air when I was talking about that little, it's only a tiny little patch I've got in my back garden there, but I've been just so lovingly looking after that for uh, a number of years, <laughs> um, about seven years. Um, and now the ground cover is the clover and the violas because they actually just come anyway. Um, and then the dandelions come in there and then I've added some other salad leaves there and it's just been a real organic kind of evolution. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing. Um, well, I think we, uh, we've got five minutes left, I think, so I might just oh, mention... Oh, we've done an hour already. I know, yeah. Maurice, <laughs> how do you chat to me so much? <laughs> I think it's, it's you chatting to me. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so i'll just mention briefly that I've, I've got this little plant i really want to build a cob greenhouse it's funny it's kind of these things come to you don't they and they come from different sources and then that oh no no I'm, i should be building a cob greenhouse on my allotment so i've sent a few feelers out and sent a few emails to people um and I want to go and get some experience because I haven't got any. I'm going to have to go and volunteer somewhere to okay. build. Well, build I'm going to give you a little tip now. Yeah. Find a double glazing salesman. Mm. Mm. And find where he sold his double glazing because when they rip the windows out, they will be perfect for a greenhouse. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I'll Just do it. recycle I'll do it. it all. Yeah. You know, some, it will only yeah. go to landfill. Definitely, yeah. This, yeah, I do know someone who does windows. Yeah, I will. Um, well, I'm hoping to. I want to put um, a rocket mass heater in the bottom as well. So what yeah. I'm hoping is, I've kind of got this plan forming that I'm going to hopefully get a group of people to come and skill share. So we, I'll get some experience, and then they can come and help me do mine. We'll learn how to do it. I'm hoping to maybe do a bit of a blog on it and film it, so we can kind of. You know, do it stage by stage and everyone else out there can get a yeah. bit of an idea about how to go about I mean, it as well. Rocket mass for a greenhouse, you know, requires quite a bit of work. Mm. But a simple mm. way is to have a solar-powered air pump that mm. takes the air from the top of the greenhouse and puts it into a rock-filled cavern that you put in the ground below and then at night when obviously the solar panel won't pump the air down there it releases the heat so mm. that's a really simple one that doesn't require any other resources excellent well actually that's another thing that's quite it's funny how these things are synchronistic because i've been chatting on facebook to a guy in canada who um does kind of you know homemade sort of energy well unfortunately it looks like Norris has disappeared we do love her though 
And I guess we could go into a bit of music. And we will put up a quick message about what next week's about. Thank you.